So yeah, I think we'll we'll get going. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Zoom event. Um, we are delighted to have our president, Paul Kelleher, here this evening to answer all your burning hill walking questions. Um, Paul, just to, for those who don't know Paul, Paul is a qualified mountaineering instructor and has worked professionally and voluntarily uh, in the industry for many, many years without giving his age away. But um, so he has a vast amount of experience to draw on for tonight. Um, in order to tailor the questions, um, to tailor the evening for everyone, we asked you to submit a few questions beforehand. So thanks for everyone for um, sending in a huge amount of questions, um, really varied as well. So we've categorized them into topics, but for those who have more questions, there'll be ample opportunity to ask them throughout the evening. Um, in order to do this, you can send questions through the Q&A box, um, or you can also raise your hand and um, we can allow you to talk, but you just need to unmute yourself as well. So whichever way you prefer. Um, so we will get going. Welcome, Paul. Uh, would you like to say anything more before we kickstart the questions? Yeah, th thanks, Ruth. Um, uh, it's kind of strange this because we're doing this as a webinar, so I can't see everybody. So the only person I can see on my screen is Ruth. So. Uh, if you kind of bear with us, this is a slightly new format. There was over 100 participants registered, so uh, that took us to a webinar. Uh, and as Ruth said, we've got kind of loads of kind of already submitted questions. We're going to start with those, but I think, yeah, I'm definitely happy to take questions at the end uh, as, as we go. So, yeah, start away. Great. So our first hot topic is uh, equipment. And um, so one of the questions sent in was um, when are the best, what are the best things to pack in your backpack when setting out for a hike in winter, particularly? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a really interesting one. It comes up a lot in discussion, you know, winter in the Irish hills, is it the same as winter elsewhere? Um, apart from all of the normal things that you would par pack in summer, uh, autumn or spring, uh, I think for me, winter, it's really, really important to uh, make sure you've got a couple of extra layers of insulation, like a good kind of uh, padded or down jacket uh, shoved in the bottom of your rucksack. And the comfort even that that makes if you have to even just stop for a quick sandwich or a bite to eat. Uh, so really it's about thinking about your layering, uh, but also thinking about not overheating. I have had situations on the hills in winter uh, when I've been leading groups where people have actually gone down with heat stroke in the middle of winter in really cold days. Uh, because they've simply piled all of the kits in their spare room onto them and they've actually overheated. So it's really important to manage your layering in winter uh, because if you get really sweaty and overheated, as you know, you then have damp clothing. So it's about thinking about a really good layering system. And the other thing I think it would really say is important in winter is making sure you stay hydrated um, and making sure you have ample sort of fluids in your rucksack. Uh, because we tend to instinctively dress, drink less in the cold, uh, but you're still dehydrating. So it's kind of really important. Uh, so really, you know, those are the kind of main items. And the other thing that, you know, then is when we get into you know, what you might call winter proper, uh, goggles can be a huge bonus to have a pair of goggles, ski goggles shoved in your rucksack. Because if you are out in snow and the wind picks up, wind blowing snow makes it really, really difficult to see, to navigate. Uh, and to just kind of exist in any comfort. Um, and I think the other thing to be aware of is like we do get conditions in the Irish Hills, uh, particularly on our higher peaks, uh, where snow can consolidate very quickly with wind uh, and freeze thaw cycles. So it is worth thinking about an ice axe and crampons. And as a rule, uh, once there's snow on the ground, I will always throw uh, at least an ice axe onto the back of my rucksack. Uh, should I not take it off or need it for the whole day, then so what? you know, a kind of modern ice axe is pretty light. And, you know, you can pick up an ice axe pretty cheaply. So uh, definitely worth thinking about those things when winter conditions are prevailing. Good stuff. And um, this one is for those solo walkers. Uh, what five items, specifically five, should a hiker have at all times when they're walking on their own? Uh, anybody that knows me or has been on the hills with me or, or camped on the hills with me will know that about a third of my rucksack's always full of food. Um, I kind of eat huge amounts of food on the hill, but it is really, like, it, you know, it's one of those things we kind of don't think about too much in gear, 
but food and fluids are hugely important uh, in terms of your energy levels uh, and particularly in terms of you know, again good hydration i mean this is really about the obvious stuff uh, you know making sure you have a good set of waterproofs uh, that work uh, particularly over trousers that you can put on and off easily over your boots uh, and a good waterproof jacket, uh, some layers, um, a small first aid kit and a kind of you know minimum of a bivy bag. Although increasingly what I carry these days is a very small shelter tent. I've got, I've got a little tiny two person shelter tent um, and it's a really useful piece of kit because it's more than an emergency piece of kit. Again, on a bad day, the ability to pile in behind a wall just shelter in a, in a little shelter tent and they're pretty cheap these days and, and you know they're so light that they're not really much weightier than a plastic bivy bag in your rucksack so those are the things that that i carry but i yeah you can eat your sandwich in comfort yeah <laughs> my life revolves my life in the hills revolves around food <laughs> uh, but it, it is you know it, there's a serious point to that that you know your energy to keep moving and you know, if you become dehydrated you very quickly kind of lose your your muscular endurance so uh, yeah and um as a club group leader would you add anything else to that yeah well the aforementioned shelter tent for me is an absolute essential when you're when you're with a group uh, like i i really unless in extremely good weather in summer uh, but for most of the year round if i'm out with a group i'll always have a shelter tent uh, capable of you know taking all of the group or a number of individual shelter tents that'll take you know, say groups of six at a time yeah. uh, but really you want a situation where you can get everybody into immediate shelter i think sometimes we think a wee bit about casualty care you know what happens when somebody in our group gets ill uh, and we think about things like a bivy bag and first aid kit but actually you know as soon as you have one person stopped in a group everybody else gets cold yeah. uh, and in terms of other essential equipment i i really put the onus back on the group to start carrying sufficient equipment to look after themselves. I'm not a big believer in carrying a huge rucksack of enough gear to deal with every eventuality and everybody in the group really. I tend to encourage groups to be very self-sufficient to make sure everybody's got spare layers. Yeah. Um, so that tends to be the approach I take to that. Uh, now this last question, I was unsure which category to put it in. So I said I'd put it in here depending on your advice, but um, what is the what is your opinion on drinking water from Irish streams when hiking? I think sadly our, our, our water supply in, in the mountains in Ireland is actually not terribly clean. Yeah. Uh, it, it often looks visually clean, uh, but the problem in, in the Irish hills largely is sheep uh, and particularly in lambing season, the risk of cryptosporidium uh, from kind of sheep is just too great a risk for me. And, and I remember some years back uh, working on a mountain leader training course and having this very discussion uh, as we followed our way up a flooded spate stream and, and everybody in the group thought it would be okay to drink the water until we rounded the next bend uh, and found a sheep floating upside down in the river mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of rapid change of opinion. So like micro water filters have got so small these days that if you're going to be out for long periods of time in hot weather to save carrying, you know, because obviously water is quite weighty. Uh, some of the little micro water filters are, are really, really good. Um, the general advice with, with dealing with water is that you need to treat with both uh, a chemical treatment and filter because in simple terms, big bugs and small bugs. Uh, so um, big bugs will be took out by a filter, but smaller bugs uh, tend to pass through filters, but fortunately can be treated with things like micro pure tablets. So, probably should be doing both if you're going to be consuming lots of water particularly on a camping trip um, yeah don't do it carry it <laughs> um so yeah that brings us to the end of equipment i just put it out there if anyone has any other questions uh, in relation to equipment before we move on i'll just give it a, a minute there or two so we can get back to them if um if anyone has any questions anyway in the q a box so we're moving on to navigation. Uh, the first question is quite uh, general, Paul. So any top tips on map reading? Um, I think my favorite thing about maps is, is I kind of treat maps as my favorite book. Uh, and I kind of tend to pour over them in the same way that you would with a kind of favorite book that you have sitting on your bookshelf at home. Uh, so spend a lot of time and really, really study your maps. Uh, 
particularly in advance of going to an area, if you're not familiar with an area, and just kind of imagine yourself in that terrain on that map. What does it look like? What do the valleys look like? What does the terrain on the side of the hill you're walking up look like? Um, are the contours really close together? So just really spending a lot of time reading maps, interpreting maps, and creating a kind of visual image in your head. Um, and that skill, once you develop that, you know, it's almost a, the ability to, to view the map three-dimensionally. That skill will probably manage you for about 90% of all of your navigation without even needing reference to a compass. Uh, and I think it's a particularly useful one at the minute because we're kind of all locked down uh, and maybe can't get out on the hills as much as we'd like. So, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity to kind of sit and plan and uh, look at your copy of Irish Peaks that you've maybe bought by now and, and look at some of the maps for that area and, and plan your little adventures for, you know, where you're going next. Um, and, and really that's my big tip is, is that map to ground interpretation and vice versa, you know, the ability to visualize from, from a map onto the ground uh, what the terrain's going to look like is, is a really important navigation skill and it's one that you'll pick up at just time, but yeah, really study your maps. I suppose that leads us on to the next hot topic of GPS versus compass, but um, the uh, I suppose in any eventuality, it's always good to be able to read a map anyway from, from ground. Yeah, but, you see, I, I find this one interesting because this often gets posed as, you know, can you substitute everything with a GPS unit? Um, and in a very simplistic sense, the, the answer is kind of yes. Uh, and where GPS works really well is if you're an ocean sailor and you're crossing the Atlantic Ocean and you're traveling in a straight line on a fairly flat surface. Um, what it isn't, however, is a substitute for navigation skills. Uh, so I don't think you can take a GPS or something like ViewRanger on your phone, for example, uh, and replace navigation skills. I think you can use an electronic map instead of a paper map uh, in many situations. But if you don't have the basic understanding of a map and mapping valleys, contours, things like that, then the ability to do something like sit at home and plot a route into ViewRanger or a GPS unit and then go out on the hill and follow that, it's going to be immediately flawed because you'll have drawn straight lines over the top of cliffs or, or you know, across valleys that involves up, up and down. Um, mountain rescue teams in Ireland uh, and in the UK consistently warn about the risks of over-reliance on electronic devices, particularly mapping apps on phones, uh, because all of those devices are, are reliant on two things. One is battery life uh, and the other is a satellite uplink, um, which bear in mind, most satellite uplinks, you know, kind of are, you know, inherently not 100% foolproof. Um, so I think it's, it's a really good tool to have in the toolbox and, and I certainly use a GPS unit and things like ViewRanger, uh, but I don't think it can replace the ability to navigate, which is slightly different uh, to, you know, a GPS versus a compass discussion. Yeah. And even if you had the GPS, the map and the, the compass would be important. I we'll tend to see to them as, yeah. yeah, sorry, I tend to see them as additional tools in my toolbox. Uh, so we tend to work on the basis that you need to be able to navigate, you need to be able to understand the basics of map reading, navigation, uh, and a compass bearing. And then you can build layers on top of that. Uh, and certainly, you know, when I'm working with clients in Scotland, for example, in really bad conditions, then, you know, absolutely having a GPS and being able to pinpoint yourself on the top of a plateau to sort of reaffirm what you're doing is a really useful thing. So like on that same vein, yes, we can become over-reliant on GPS because as we rely more on electronic devices to do the work for us, we stop honing our other navigation skills. So I think it's important that we kind of keep those skills up and continue to hone them and practice them because otherwise, like any other skill, they'll get kind of dusty in the cupboard. Yeah. Uh, there's another question on navigation here. Uh, assuming I have, the, I have a route card prepared ahead of time, how and when should you turn back if necessary? I think this is one of these questions that the answer starts with, it depends. <laughs> um, I think you have to make a lot of judgments, you know, uh, as a hill walker, uh, 
you know, ultimately we aspire towards independence and self-sufficiency and personal responsibility. So you need to make decisions. If you're asking that question, you know, should I turn back? Then I think at that stage, you probably answered your own question on the hill. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you're planning to walk across, you know, really any mountain range in Ireland, um, there will be things that will dictate that plan for the day and may well change that plan. So like the question here says, a route card prepared ahead of time. Well, we know that Atlantic weather systems do not always follow a week old forecast, for example. So if you find on the morning of your planned routes that the Atlantic weather system that was supposed to come in at midnight tonight is actually gonna come in at four o'clock this afternoon, then that might certainly influence your route choice. If you're on the hill, either individually or, you know, as part of a group or looking after a group as a group leader in a club, then you need to be constantly evaluating your well-being, the group's well-being, uh, the prevailing weather conditions, people's tiredness. Daylight hours is the classic one, of course, at this stage of the year. So having having that kind of sensible decision-making process in your head about, you know, should I go on? Should I go back? There's always a point, you know, on any walk where you kind of cross a point of no return where actually turning around, going back or using an escape route is going to actually take you longer than finishing the route. Yeah. So all I would say is it's just constant evaluation, you know, evaluate what's going on around you with, you know, your friends, your peers, your group and the weather conditions around you and the daylight hours uh, to avoid becoming benighted or, you know, stumbling off the hill very late in the evening when you're very, very tired and more prone to an accident. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Paul. There's no more questions on navigation just yet, so we're going to move on to training. Um, so, uh, yeah, this question is particularly in relation to the mountain skills um, course. So there is a current requirement for mountain skills assessment that candidates must have logged 14 walks within the last six months before their assessment. So if, you know, the certain people may have loads of uh, walks done over many years, but um, they mightn't have time to manage uh, such walks frequently. So is this something that Mountaineer in Ireland could relax a little or what's your opinion on that? Um, I, I'm loath to, to quote an opinion here that entirely changes our training structure ad hoc. Uh, and uh, Jane will get loads of phone calls to the office in the morning to say, the president just said, yeah. uh, can, can I deal with this more generally? And um, what I found over the years of working as a trainer and assessor on all of the mountain leader training schemes that exist uh, on this island, pretty much, uh, is that more often than not, as trainers and as assessors, we are dealing, uh, if there are difficulties, the difficulties arise where candidates do not have enough experience. So I, I think the person that posed this question, you know, has been walking for a very long period of time. Uh, over probably lots of varied terrain, lots of different mountain ranges. Uh, and what they're saying is, well, do I need to compress that sort of sudden bit into the last six months? Um, what I would do would suggest you do that in individual cases, you know, where you feel you have ample experience, I would encourage you to kind of phone the training office in Mountaineer in Ireland and talk to Jane uh, about your specific case. But generally, you know, the reason that those sorts of requirements are in in all of the schemes between training and assessment is to ensure that when you attend a training course uh, that you spend time to practice and hone the skills that you've learned on that training course before coming for assessment so they tend to be guideline figures uh, that are in there uh, but they're in there for a very good reason because what we do want candidates doing is saying well i've only got half of the 14 i've only got seven days out on the hill and quite often when you distill that down uh, maybe only two or three of those were really good quality mountain days and you know some of the other days were on familiar walks so I think all I would say is you know ultimately there's a responsibility on candidates when they turn up for assessment to make sure that they kind of have honed all of those skills so uh, but yeah in individual cases talk to Jane uh, I guess uh, first thing yeah um, and another question uh, which leads us on to group management in a minute but I am so a mountain leader um, trainee, should they consider joining a club to gain experience leading groups? Um, I think there's probably all sorts of reasons to join a Mountaineer in Ireland club. Uh, you know, I think not only will you gain experience from potentially assisting and leading groups, 
uh, if you're going for your Mountain of the Year award. Uh, but also the club will benefit from your experience. So, you know, you get to work alongside other experienced uh, club leaders. Um, it's it's a really good way of gaining experience. Uh, I would caveat that and say you absolutely have to continue to develop your own personal skills as well alongside that. But look, I mean, I think it's kind of you know, definitely worth looking towards a club, your local club, uh, and helping out with kind of walks and stuff uh, to gain that experience. I think the dynamic of working with a group is something that you can't kind of fake with your friends in the same way. Um, you know, it's it's always easier to be real with a group of kind of relative strangers in a club setting than it is with you know a close knit group of your friends, um, you know, who tell you maybe what you want to hear as you prepare for assessment. Yeah, exactly. And it might be you might be put in other situations that you mightn't be put in with your, your friends as such to kind of. In, in certain, in, you know, with with a with a very group of club members as well. You know, one of the things that. I guess, well, I'll probably cover it in the next bit then about, you know, kind of group leadership. Uh, but yeah, I just think it's, it's better to sometimes work with groups of strangers. Yeah. So that moves us on to group management. This is a, There was a lot of questions in on this particular um, area, uh, specifically around like, you know, characteristics or tips on becoming um, a good mountain leader or, you know, specific skills that you need to be a good hill walking leader. I think, you know, I can kind of cover these in, in, in the one piece because, you know, I think they're you know, fundamentally kind of very similar question. For me, the biggest, the most important skill is the skill of empathy. Um, you know, you need to be able to uh, not be driven by your objective by the day, so for the day solely, uh, and you need to really take into account your group. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you end up out with a group of really experienced walkers for the day, who you've been out with before any of us can be having a kind of bad day where you know yesterday's dinner didn't agree with us uh, we've got a bit of a bug coming on whatever so i think that skill of empathy is really important and i think the other thing i would say about kind of managing groups over the years is and this is true of any job that you're working with people the, the most difficult thing that you have to do is manage expectations and uh, so you know, when you take on the role uh, of, of leader and um, your group has certain expectations of you. Uh, your group has expectations about what they want from the day, about what you're going to deliver, about your style of leadership, about all of those things. And good communication is really, really important at the start of the day. So, you know, think out uh, what is your objective for the day? Have a discussion with group members, in, if, if possible at all, preferably in advance. Ask them what their objectives for the day are. And if you find yourself with a group with you know very differing objectives for the day, then to be honest, before you tie your laces on your boots, you're in trouble. Uh, because if you've got a group with very varied expectations, you're not going to meet them all. So that's really important, I think. Um, and beyond that, it, it is just the ability to evaluate the situation as you go. So in the course of your day, you know, out walking, uh, you need to evaluate kind of all of what you set out at the start of the day, is it still possible? Uh, is it still achievable? Is everybody still on board with that objective? You know, so, you know, use your use your time, like your lunch breaks, chat to people, have conversations with people and, and, and kind of check in with people as you go. Yeah, I suppose one of the issues you might come up against would be uh, this particular question, uh, what do you do when the route planned on paper at home in advance is not possible on the day of the hike? So you, you land up and the path doesn't exist or the train is not possible, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, some of this comes down to the level of diligence of your route planning, but also your experience of planning. Uh, you know, so if you're working in a reasonably familiar area, you should be you know, comparatively familiar with, you know, well, does that path actually exist in reality? Um, there are lots of mountain ranges where there are old grass tracks and old bog tracks marked as dotted lines that actually on the ground are very, very hard to follow. Uh, if you're working in an unfamiliar area, then, you know, reach out to other people who may know that area particularly well, you know, reach out to another Mountaineering Ireland club in the area that you're unfamiliar with and say, listen, I'm taking a group down next weekend. Uh, I'm just checking, you know, is the access okay at that point? What's the approach like up that valley? 
the one thing that's more likely to actually change the terrain on the day of the hike is, is weather you know so you, you plan your route on paper at home in advance uh, and the weather forecast for that day brings in a band of heavy rain or the night before and you know the first stream of your day uh, is is kind of you know in spate and you can't cross it uh, so I think the ability to kind of rapidly come up with a plan B is a really useful skill for a leader um, and even better if you kind of have a plan B in your head to say well if that doesn't work on the day for whatever reason uh, I mean the other thing that can obliterate paths very quickly as we know is snow uh, so you know snow can turn terrain that has a very obvious path into something that is just a, a great big white blanket um, so yeah just evaluate and I think, you know, it is back to the leadership skills as well. Don't be overly pressured by other people's expectations. Take your time and go, well, actually, I know we plan to do this today, but the weather's really bad, so we're not doing it. Uh, and I'll quote the example of a friend who was working with a group in Scotland in winter. Uh, and he had spent almost an entire week working with a group, talking to them about weather, about avalanche ha hazards, about safe movement over the terrain. And at the end of the week, they wanted to do a particular route. And one of the group was most insistent that they still wanted to do this route. And he said, look, what have I told you all week? It's just, I mean, you know, all of the skills we've taught all week means that's not possible. Uh, and this person was most insistent. And he said, look, if we do it, you're going to die. <laughs> it's like, he had to go that far to get it through to them. So don't be over pressured as a leader. And, you know, if, if you plan something in best effort at home and you turn up and it's just not going to plan, then be prepared to put your hands up and say, listen, this is just not, this is not working out the way I planned it. We're going to do something different. Yeah. Don't be pressured. Yeah. And so uh, the next topic, yeah, there's a few questions specifically to our current situation. Um, one question was, uh, what is the best way to practice your technical skills like navigation during lockdown? You, know, you briefly mentioned it there. Yeah, like it comes back to my earlier comment about, you know, I, I kind of, um, I kind of treat my maps as books and I spend a lot of time reading them uh, and I spend a lot of time thinking about route planning and you know where I'm going and things like that. I think the other thing is is thinking about some kind of literature uh, and most of you will have seen uh, this book from Mountain Training uh, Scheme. Uh, yeah. although, although we end at, at you know, the Mountain Leader Training Scheme, it's actually a really good book, it's got really good session. This is actually an older version, I think it's now on version three possibly. Uh, but uh, that's a really good book there's also a comparative winter skills uh, version of it and this has a particularly good section on navigation in winter which is really useful uh, there's a navigation book in that series as well uh, and you know you can do lots of planning yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know I mean you have to be realistic that you know during lockdown we've, we've now been kind of in and out of a series of lockdowns for about 12 months and in that period um, you know all of our skills will have got rusty uh, so when you go back out and when we can all get back out into the hills and have little adventures again plan your adventures with with that in mind that you know look I've, I've gone a wee bit rusty a um, couple of people there saying sorry they can't see the books Ruth's going to uh, type, type the titles into the chat box for you. Yeah, I have them actually printed at the end of the presentation. Yeah. So, they, yeah. so um, great. Thanks, Ruth. So, yeah, look, I mean, just be realistic about the fact that, you know, all of those skills will be rusty uh, and plan some safe adventures to, to kind of, you know, get your skill base back up when, when we're out of lockdown. There was a question there uh, just in relation to group management as well. Um, a person turns up for a walk or a climb not correctly equipped. Do you go ahead? Or what would you do? Uh, I think my advice here is, you know, if you can stand over that you've communicated that information properly in advance uh, and that you've made it really clear if somebody turns up without waterproofs or without a pair of boots, they will not be going on the walk for the day. And I think, you, you, you know, there's the tough love thing here. You need to stick to that position. It is really, really important, back to the managing expectations piece, it's really important that you communicate that information in advance and communicate it very, very clearly, that if you turn up on the day without a pair of boots or without a waterproofs or without whatever else you've specified on your kit list, then you'll be getting back into your car and going home or going to the coffee shop because you'll not be taking them on the walk for the day. I think it, you know, 
if if you communicate in advance that says, for example, you know, everybody in the group's going to need boots today because we're going up into the mountains as opposed to going for a stroll along a forest track. And somebody turns up without boots and you say, no, it's not ideal, but come on ahead anyway. Now, four hours later, when you're waiting on the mountain rescue team to come to rescue that person with a broken ankle in the trainers, justify your decision making. Yeah. You can't. Or if something really bad happens and somebody slips on really steep ground who goes toppling out over a cliff uh, and gets seriously injured or killed and yeah. you're in front of a coroner saying, uh, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Leader, uh, defend your decision making. Uh, everybody else was wearing boots. Why was my client not? You yeah. couldn't defend that decision. So, yeah, really clear communication with people and just hold, hold the line. Yeah. And you're setting an example for the rest of the group as well, then, yeah. by, by what you answer. Yeah. Um, so this is a direct question. Um, it is how are you keeping up your fitness during lockdown? Well, that's really <laughs> simple or not. <laughs> um, this time last year, I was planned on a three week ski mountaineering trip to the Alps, uh, which went ahead. Uh, and I got back to Ireland a week before France locked down. Uh, when I left Ireland, a uh, double uh, World Health Organization hadn't declared a pandemic. So after three weeks of kind of skiing and ski mountaineering uh, in the Alps, I was feeling really fit. Uh, and then I came back and, you know, I haven't been able to do a fraction of that activity. Um, so, yeah, I'm really unfit and I've put on loads of weight. <laughs> uh, but do you know what? We'll deal with that in the summertime. Uh, I'm pretty fortunate. I live in Fermanagh, uh, so I've got lots of really big forest parks and kind of sit on the edge of the kind of Kulka uh, kind of area. So I can get out and about and walk in the forests. I, I run a bit occasionally. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, look, if, if you're as fit, after the lockdown, uh, as you were before it, you've obviously had the, the fortunate position of plenty of free time, uh, which I haven't had. <laughs> and if you're not, we have another Zoom meeting coming up in two weeks' time to give you a few tips on getting your fitness back up there for when we can get back on the hills. So uh, you can stay tuned for that one. <laughs> uh, so the next topic is uh, the weather, actually. Uh, let me just move along here. So. The first question is, in your opinion, what is the toughest weather to hike in? It's like any, any discussion on weather in Ireland. We can just talk all night on this one topic. Yeah. Um, personally, I actually find extreme heat, you know, kind of those really, even in Ireland, those kind of really, really hot kind of days, you know, with temperature kind of heads up towards kind of high 20s, 30 degrees. Uh, I think that's really, really difficult to walk in because um, there's very little you can do to actively cool. Uh, you're dealing with the risk of kind of heat stroke, sunburn, uh, and you've got to carry loads of water. So you end up with this kind of bag full of water um, sloshing around. Um, comparatively, you know, kind of wet weather, cold weather, snowy weather, you can kit up, you know, kit so good these days, you can insulate against the cold much easier. So personally, I find that, that kind of really hot weather the most difficult to move in. Uh, but I guess that's a personal opinion, maybe to some degree. Maybe some yeah. people just love those hot days. They prefer them than the damn Scottish uh, winter weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good looking over there this year. Yeah, yeah. Untouched. Uh, the other one then is, uh, yeah, in particular, in relation to wind warnings, is it recommended to go out, say, for instance, in an orange warning, but change walk in accordance with weather on the day? Uh, I think the person that asked this question kind of answered their own question here. Um, I think any plan you make should always be dependent on, you know, the weather and conditions on the day. Uh, and bear in mind, you know, like, I mean, how many orange warnings do we actually get in the course of a year? It's not that many. And even when we do get them, they tend to blow through in about six or eight hours. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a good bit of planning might say, well, actually, there's an orange weather warning in force for the Saturday and I plan to go walking. Well, I'll not. I'll go walking on the Sunday. Um, and bear in mind also that orange wind warnings uh, in Ireland very seldom come on their own. They tend to come with very high degrees of particip of uh, rain, I can't yeah. speak. Uh, so, you know, if you've got an orange wind warning with driving rain, then you need to think about what will be the effect on your clothing? What will be the effect on the stream that you're planning to cross later in the afternoon to get back to your car? Uh, are you going to get cut off? And I think the other thing I would say is, you know, 
changing your walk in accordance with the weather on the day, again, you need to do with a fair bit of discretion. So, you know, maybe you can find a nice valley walk uh, that gives you the experience of being out for a couple of hours safely. Uh, again, bearing in mind that, you know, valleys and river bottoms are prone to kind of flash flooding in those conditions. Um, but equally, you may want to avoid the local forest area uh, where the danger of falling trees uh, or a coastal walk where there's the danger of big surf or being swept off a cliff. Uh, so I think, you know, as with any weather, a lot of discretion and a lot of, you know, honest questioning of yourself, you know, about, well, you know, can I realistically kind of get out and have an enjoyable day in that? Um, because, you know, whatever mountain you're planning to go up will be there tomorrow. Yeah. In a probably more enjoyable atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is about good planning as well. And in the run up to, you know, you, you maybe plan, you know, your club activities months, weeks ahead, maybe a full year ahead in some cases. Uh, but constantly evaluate that plan coming up to the time, you know, in the same way, if you plan to walk over high tops and uh, there's a forecast for lots and lots of snow, uh, you would have to ask questions like, you know, is everybody equipped and able to walk and manage those conditions? Am I able to manage a group in those conditions? Uh, am I able to manage the number in that group? So just a constant evaluation and constant decision making, I think is really important. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're moving along nicely. Uh, we're going on to emergencies, which is probably another broad topic as well. But um, the first question is, what are the most common or likely emergencies in the hills? And how should they be avoided or dealt with? I think if we look at mountain rescue statistics, um, you'll very quickly find that most injuries occur at the end of the day. Uh, and most injuries occur in descent and or on the edge of darkness. So when we think about common emergencies, you know, I actually think those emergencies often start right back with route planning. Uh, so you know, in, in terms of avoiding and dealing with those issues, really good route planning, being realistic about your journey for the day, allowing enough kind of slippage time in the day that if people are just walking that a little bit slower, that you don't end up descending kind of a fairly steep descent at the end of the day, uh, you know, coming off a peak uh, with a tired group, because that's, you know, when you're likely to get injuries. And, you know, a lot of those injuries are lower limb injuries. They are ankle and knee injuries. Uh, you know, caused by trips and sprains, but actually many of those are caused by kind of tired legs and tired brains uh, at the end of the day. So really good route planning, uh, being realistic, uh, you know, descending to the devil's ladder of Karen Tool uh, at four o'clock on a winter's afternoon is probably not a kind of great plan for the day. Uh, you're going to massively increase the risk of injury. Um, so yeah, good planning and um, you know, making sure that people can get off with still enough reserve energy, uh, kind of not busting people, you know, not kind of beasting people on super long days to the point where they're, you know, um, absolutely exhausted. And many walkers may well want kind of longer or challenge walks, and that's okay if, if, if you're fit and kind of skilled up for that. But yeah, just make sure that your plan kind of measures up with the group that you're working with for the yeah, day. Because comes back to your earlier suggestion about you know having the correct equipment footwear like is so important as well like with slips and descents and stuff as well it, it, it's kind of interesting like we, we we seen uh, the mountain rescue statistics for ireland last year and uh, just in 2020 despite kind of a series of lockdowns were significantly up on previous years now we know that there are vast numbers of of kind of new folk taking up walking in the hills uh, you know, we see kind of online Facebook groups with lots of pretty photographs that attract more people out into the hills and, and it's kind of a bit of a cycle. Uh, and, you know, I think that's great at many levels. I think the enthusiasm of people that have kind of discovered and found the outdoors uh, is great. But sometimes there's a gap between, you know, finding something new and finding a new sport and, you know, gaining enough experience to kind of keep yourself safe. So there's kind of a, the potential there. Uh, and I think, you know, back to my earlier comment about what kit you have, you know, making sure that if you do have an emergency, you have a kind of you know, reasonable first aid kit and, you know, having a shelter tent will really make a difference because, you know, if you do have to call out mountain rescue, uh, and I would always say to people, certainly call out a rescue team uh, sooner rather than later, because the longer you leave it, 
you know, the kind of worsening conditions that everybody's going to be in. Uh, but if you do need to call out for help and call out a rescue team, the difference that a rescue team will find a warm group inside a shelter tent with good morale uh, or one that's kind of on the brink of hypothermia will, will make a huge difference to what happens in the next couple of hours when they safely extract you from the hill. So, yeah, yeah. bit of kit. Um, if um, the next question then, yeah, this comes up a lot within clubs, actually, if leading a group and someone gets ill or injured, should the group stay together or split up? Uh, this is very much a depends question. Yeah. Uh, so for me, there's a couple of things I would want to think about here. So if, if you have somebody ill or injured, then the first kind of step in my mind is about what do you need to secure that casualty's well-being? Uh, and if that's a couple of people in the group to get into the shelter tent with them, to make sure the shelter tent stays put in windy weather uh, and keeps them stable whilst you know somebody, the group leader treats them, then that's your first line. Your second line has to be, how do you look after the rest of the group? Because as we all know, once you stop moving in the hills, you start to cool very quickly. So, you know, if you take a group of 12 people uh, and one person gets ill or injured, what you absolutely want to avoid is, deal is ending up with 11 other casualties as well. Uh, the decision about the group staying together or splitting up very much depends on the experience within the group. So if you're in a group from your local club and you've got two experienced leaders in that group, then a reasonable decision might be for one leader to stay with the casualty and a couple of people to assist them uh, and another leader to take the remaining party off the hill. And that will simplify the mountain rescue team's job. And uh, at the end of the day, if they only have to kind of help a couple of people off the hill late in the day. However, what you don't want to get into is making decisions that you are assuming people's competence and assuming that the rest of the group can get down safely. Uh, so if you're making that decision to split up, then it has to be on the basis that whoever is leaving that particular site to follow an escape route, etc., can safely complete that route to, to the road, to their cars, and uh, to safety. Uh, otherwise, you're better absolutely staying there because what you'll end up with is a mountain rescue team having to search for three or four split up groups. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, as I say, the length of the route, the ease of the escape route, the experience of the group, the experience of another group leader will all affect that decision. No hard and fast answer there. Yeah, thanks. Well, um, the question just came through there. Would you insist on everyone carrying a head torch, especially during winter months? Absolutely, in winter. Um, I mean, trying to, trying to walk off the hill on, on even moderately complex terrain, like a rocky track, uh, you know, tripping over boulders without a head torch or relying on the light of somebody else's head torch is, you know, just a recipe for injury. Uh, I mean, I don't really mind whether it's a head torch or a hand torch, to be honest. I mean, a head torch is particularly handy for you as a navigator to be able to kind of, you know, read your map. To be honest, as long as somebody has a torch uh, that produces a decent enough light that they can see where they're going, uh, not overly fussy. I mean, a head torch these days is, you know, you can get a basic head torch pretty cheap. Uh, and even some of the, you know, the kind of cheap models out of, um, some of the kind of large retail outlets uh, are pretty reliable. Uh, worth carrying a few uh, kind of ordinary sized batteries, you know, treble A and AA batteries, kind of a little plastic bag in the bottom of your bag, because sooner or later, you know, somebody's head torch will have flat batteries, you can be sure of it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, having spare batteries for your own head torch, if your own head torch runs out, makes you look pretty smart anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And the weather can affect the battery as well, can't it? Yeah, I mean, batteries are batteries are obviously limited by, you know, cold weather will, will greatly impact on, on batteries. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I carry a little spare, tiny micro head torch, one of those little, um, the ones that take a little button sized battery. Uh, I carry one of those in my first aid kit as a spare. Uh, oh yeah, always handy to have. Um, yeah. So we're moving on there. This is the, the last section. So if anyone has any other questions that they're thinking of, they can pop it in the Q&A or the chat box there as well. Um, we're just moving on to, yeah, this is primarily an access question. So it's, um, it's regarding styles. What are Engineering Ireland doing to encourage farmers and other landowners to install styles to avoid damage to fences and walls is the first part of the question. I mean, our Access and Conservation Committee and our Access and Conservation Officer works continuously on, on, on these sorts of issues throughout the country. 
so, I mean, it's one of those kind of fairly constant agenda items that comes up in the Access Conservation Report, for example, for the Mountaineer and Iron Board, uh, and the Access and Conservation Committee will work on. But actually, many of these issues are actually best solved at a local level. And, and I think, you know, I would always say to members, we need to be very realistic that our professional team, uh, Ruth, Helen, Damien, Jane, uh, et cetera, in the office, are actually a very small team. Uh, and, you know, to try and solve every issue, and there are multiple access issues across the country, as many of you will know at the minute, uh, all on our own uh, for Helm doing that is, is simply an impossible task. So I'd really encourage local walkers, uh, local uh, clubs, local members to engage with, with the local farming community around them. If there is specific issues that they're struggling with, uh, and they want advice then you know absolutely Helen will provide that advice uh, and guidance uh, in terms of best practice etc uh, but bear in mind that you know all of us live ultimately within an elect an elected area where we elect our local council representatives so again in terms of things like funding and lobbying there is no reason why individual members can't kind of you know take that up at a local level uh, with Mountaineer and Ireland support from centre but you know uh, the sheer scale of, of you know, access challenges that we're facing across Ireland at the minute. And, you know, some of the very genuine fears of landowners about things like dogs on the hills, uh, you know, about the risk of litigation, etc., is all causing a pressure, you know. So as a local club, having a good working relationship with many of the landowners in your area is, is going to be to the benefit of, of the entire kind of hill walking and mountaineering community. So, you know, absolutely encourage you to do that. The Mourns, Ruth, is a rather unique situation, and it's a very interesting one in that the Mourns is kind of managed by Mourn Heritage Trust in that respect. So the replacement styles will have been organised by Mourn Heritage Trust or in some places the National Trust where they own the land around Cecily of Donard. Uh, but that's a really good example of a kind of community-based group, what was originally a community-based group set up in Newcastle uh, that has grown over the years, sought professional funding, and and now kind of is very engaged with that, uh, that whole Mourn area. Uh, so obviously things like mountain access scheme been discussed in some areas, but it's some way off delivering a kind of, you know, island wide solution at this stage. So yeah, I mean, build local relationships, build local friendships, stop and chat to the farmer, uh, talk to them about the pressures and issues and concerns they have and talk to them about solutions, you know, be it styles, be it gates, be it, uh, you know, reaching out and, and making sure that, you know, access issues are identified really early and communicated out uh, via Mountaineer and Iron to other clubs, uh, etc. Get involved. Yeah. Actually, just speaking about getting involved, like myself as the Hillwalk and Development Officer, I'm always keen to hear from members as well. Um, we're always at the end of the phone or an email just if there's any queries uh, locally as well, or if we can link in with yourselves from a local side with clubs. Um, we also have uh, two vacancies on the Hillwalking Committee at the moment, so if there are people in the audience tonight that are keen to get involved or are interested in the work that we do, uh, just get in touch with myself as well. Um, this was this, this is just a question coming up there. Um, what a great amount of information. I'm new to Hillwalking, so delighted to have been given uh, the opportunity, so thanks. Um, yeah, this was just to... Uh, just to share those resources that you mentioned earlier, Paul, as well, um, and yeah, I put yeah. up the, the navigation events as well. I find that particularly good as well. Um, these are all available on our um, on the Mountaineer in Ireland shop as well. Now, um, it's quite restrictive at the moment because of access to the office, but um, they are available online as well. Um, also, there's a lot of useful information on mountaineering.ie and there's a, a hill walking section as well. Uh, we've recently uh, published happy hiking campaigns, just simple, straightforward information in relation to like general information about, you know, emergency planning a route when enjoying the outdoors responsibly. So there's lots of information there um, as well online. Um, so I suppose just open it up to see if there's any more questions before we close it up. So I think that's all the questions for now. I just want to say a very, very big thank you, Paul, for taking the time um, 
for, to share your amazing experience, you know, your expertise and um, your knowledge. Um, and I, I personally got a lot out of it as well. And I hope um, all the other participants did too. Um, just to mention as well, the Zoom around the mountains continues and it's on for the next uh, couple of weeks. So just put up what's left. Um, so there is still spaces available if anyone would like to register um, for any of the, the events coming up there. So Paul, thanks again and um, take care everyone. Thank you everybody and hopefully we'll kind of all be out and about soon uh, and look forward to maybe bumping into many years on the hills. Yeah. Thank you.